Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. One of the questions that's often asked when we have Dhamma sessions or meditation retreats is a question that all of us have asked at one time or another. And the question is, how do we translate what we do in our meditation practice, whether it's from daily practice or even what we do in Dhamma sessions and retreats into everyday life? How do we connect it? And of course, it's a very important question. To answer that question, it's good to look at the different ways that we practice the Dhamma. So what is often encouraged firstly is daily practice, that one develops a particular regular practice in daily life. So that would entail sitting meditation, where you practice and start developing those insight pathway meditations and to continue to access the higher levels of concentration. The reason that that is encouraged is because whether you're a layperson or a monastic, you need to make sure that you're exercising that muscle, that you're strengthening it. But in Buddha's terms, it's really about sharpening the faculties, the spiritual faculties and the powers, and to continuously activate the Noble Eightfold Path. When you meditate sequentially, following the Buddha's instructions, you are always activating from right view. All of Buddha's meditations begin with correcting our view. When you correct the view, you obtain right view and abandon wrong view. And therefore, what unfolds is the activating of the Noble Eightfold Path. You develop right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The more you do that, the more you are leaning towards Nibbana, the more you are developing the wholesome path. And when it comes to everyday life, that counts for something because when you go out into the world, what happens is you're always challenged. You're always challenged by responsibilities, interactions, collisions with things and people, and the right view is always challenged. So it's really important to develop that daily practice, sitting, walking, lying down and standing. What is good is to make sure that you particularly do the sitting and the walking, whether it's even for 15 minutes or more, because when you actually do that and you set aside some time, that is your time where you make an agreement with yourself and you put runs on the board. So when it comes to regret or guilt that you haven't done anything, then having that regular period of practice is really good. At some point, you'll find that if you are working, it becomes a lifesaver of sorts. When you wake up in the morning, you set your intentions by doing a daily sit. You know what's coming is the challenge to your speech and your actions, your livelihood. So when you sit in the morning, you're clarifying your intention and you're setting the day forward with the right view. You have done your best to begin the day with the right view. And you can also have good intent towards others. When you cultivate metta, for example, in the morning before you go to work or do your daily activities, it's a very good habit because you know what's coming is an angry world, a polarized world, a world that is not happy. So if you lift the mind before you take on the day, it can be very helpful in terms of the easefulness for the rest of the day. It doesn't mean that it will all go smooth, but it means you might have more mind energy, more groundedness, more steadiness to face the day and to take on what comes up, what unfolds. When it comes to an evening sit or walk, what's very useful is to cleanse. We often, when we reflect, the day can be quite filthy. There's pollution in the mind. We've gathered things naturally because when you work, that's what happens. The people that you work with have different challenges and there are defilements that arise at work because of the conditions at work. Same with other situations. Even when we're doing good, if you notice, defilements always have the opportunity to come because conditions are set a particular way. And so when you know that, when you come home and you have an evening sit or an evening walking meditation, then it's about cleansing. 
it's so that you put the day down in a very conscious way. You cleanse the mind of every single defilement, running through the Vatupama Sutta or Anumana Sutta, or doing the Karaniya Metta Sutta, because that in itself is also cleansing. Any regrets you might have from the day, whether it's through body, speech and mind, you cleanse it. And you make another intention, a strong determination to try again. And when you cultivate metta before you go to sleep, you know that one of the blessings is that you go to sleep easily and you wake up easily. You don't have bad dreams. And so that's a very good thing when it comes to having a very busy day, a lot of responsibilities with family and work and other things. And so it's very good. When you have the ability in your day to do practice during the day, and I mean that not in the sense of colliding with work or colliding with other responsibilities, but something where you take a few moments out of the day, maybe during your commute or maybe when it's your lunch break and there's a quiet time, you might go and sit in the park or some quiet place that you have. That can also be useful as long as it's not opposing or colliding with your other responsibilities. If you have that good fortune to be able to take time out, then it can be very useful. A few pockets or moments of peace, calming the mind, reminding of the right view, these can be very helpful. But not everyone has that opportunity. Sometimes the day runs off with us. It's very busy. And so it's easier just to go with the day. And when you go home and have that time for a daily sit or a daily walk, a meditation, a formal meditation and that's when you take that time to really look at the defilements, cultivate the skilled states of mind, wishing others well. Now when we pepper our lives with wholesome things like Dhamma sessions and meditation retreats, these are very important. Dhamma sessions are very important is because we actively choose to listen to the Buddha's words. We may also do that outside of Dhamma sessions. We may read some suttas, we may even listen to Dhamma talks and look through our notes and things that we have gathered in terms of being able to understand the Dhamma. That's also all very good. When it comes to Dhamma sessions, what's really important about it is coming together with Kalyanamitta. Dhamma sessions provide the opportunity to listen to a desana, a talk, and then to hear the Buddha's words, particularly if it's someone who's suvacha to the Buddha. Usually when you attend a session where people are reading out the Buddha's words, that is very good because Buddha is the perfect teacher. And what we try to do in our development process, our bhavana, we're trying to understand the phrasing and the meaning of where the Buddha is coming from. So anyone who is helping you to do that then that is very good. Usually the Buddha says, when you listen to the Buddha's words with eager ears, that is when the defilements are removed. One can listen attentively, the hindrances are not there. So when that is the case, it's very good because most of the time it's quite difficult, the hindrances are there. We have sensual desire, we have ill will, sloth and torpor, there is restlessness and worry and of course doubt. Dhamma sessions can be very good when it brings us together with other Kalyanamitta. We join together with more mental energy. There is a dropping off of responsibilities at that time because you have allocated some time towards a Dhamma session. And you get to hear Dhamma discussion and participate in Dhamma discussion. So questions and answers, the ability to receive answers to certain things that have been troubling you and to hear other people's questions, which when they ask, it's also for the benefit of others. And so one of those things is Dhamma sessions. They're very important. They're like nourishment. They nourish the Dhamma Dhatu and that is all of our rafts. If you think about needing to cross to the other side, which is the side where there is Nibbana, liberation, path and fruit, then we need the Dhamma raft in order to do that. 
So regular Dhamma sessions, like if you belong to a meditation group, if you have good Kalyanamitta who want to regularly talk Dhamma or have a talk and questions and answers afterwards, that's very helpful. Because when you make that regular, it also helps with discipline. Sometimes what you find when you start a new job, when you have certain challenges in life that come up, when you have a very busy life, maybe a lot of family responsibilities or work is really pressured, maybe there are financial difficulties and, and other things, or maybe something really quite unexpected happened that caused a lot of devastation, then what gets challenged is mainly the daily practice. It falls away. When you know that, sometimes it's very difficult to come back to daily practice, but one needs to remember that even a few minutes a day is very important. Don't allow the other turbulence in life to take that away from you because that's quite precious. That gives you the mind energy and the peace in order to be able to tackle what is troubling and difficult in your life, whatever that is. And so when it comes to sessions, what is helpful is that when you are low in mental energy, when you are overwhelmed with the life circumstances, Dhamma sessions and Kalyanamitta have this way of motivating, inspiring, pulling you back in, saying, come along on this path again. Don't fall by the wayside. Don't deviate. Come along. We're in this together. We're walking this together. You're not alone. Don't allow the defilements. Don't allow the pressures of daily life get to you. Just come along. Only if you listen, that's fine. Do a little meditation, but just come along. And so if you have Kalyanamitta like that, if you have people that always encourage you, people that kindly invite you, people that just check on you, people that remind you about the Dhamma, remind you about doing wholesome things, walking the wholesome path, then make the most of that opportunity. Do what you can towards that. Join in if you can. And then with meditation retreats, this is quite an important one. And there are a lot of different meditation retreats. So let me clarify what I mean by meditation retreats. The meditation retreats that are very important are the ones that clearly help you to enter the stream and develop further path and fruit. And that is the intention of the people teaching them. Those are the ones that are very important because time is actually very short. What you don't get from the world is the sense of urgency. What you get from the world instead is there's plenty of time. Deal with these little fires that are propping up in, in your life right now. Or indulge, don't worry, you have plenty of time, do it later. There's no sense of urgency. Enjoy sensual pleasures, enjoy the work, pay attention to these things. These people are more important, all that sort of stuff. Whatever way that it comes up, the world can be very enticing. It's conditioned to pull you out away from the spiritual path. It's not a judgment, it's more of a fact. It's Mara's world. It's not set any other way. When you think about expectation from the world. The world expects you to keep busy. If you remember the session on happiness and joy, when you're too busy, that means the delight in Dhamma falls away. You delight in keeping busy, attending to always work. Work is the priority. Family life is the priority. All the things associated with building the life, with busyness, entertainment. That is what you delight in, whether you know it or not. But what falls away is the delight in Dhamma, the value that you potentially would see in Dhamma, it falls away. So when we talk about meditation retreats, this is different from daily practice and it's different from Dhamma sessions, Dhamma talks, that sort of thing. This is very much about giving someone the opportunity to enter the stream. So when we have these retreats, these kinds of retreats, when someone says, I'll take half a day to attend the retreat, I'll take a whole day to do a retreat, 
I'll take two days to do the retreat. I'll take four days to do the retreat. And of course, we know that more days are very difficult if you have to work, if you have family responsibilities, if you have financial pressures, all kinds of things like that, then of course, any time that you give feels strained. It feels like you can't do it. But when it comes to the Dhamma and the sense of urgency and seeing the truth, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when the end comes. And when you see that and you think, if I haven't entered the stream and death is coming and you don't know what is going to happen next, you wish for a happy destination. You wish if you have some insight for Nibbana. But the issue is that it could be lower realms. You don't have safety from that. Then you start to see how precious entering the stream is. Buddha says that it's so precious because you are cutting off countless lifetimes of dukkha. If you can see the noble truth of suffering in this lifetime, if you can understand jati pi dukkha, birth is dukkha, that everything that we're going through even right now is part of jati pi dukkha, and then you start to see jarami dukkha, old age is also dukkha, sickness is dukkha, death is dukkha, then you realize you are bound to this and bound to worse than what you're experiencing right now if you don't make some effort to correct the view, to understand karma, to walk the Noble Eightfold Path, to develop the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the way out of suffering. So attending meditation retreats needs to be a priority, particularly if you can attend a retreat that is going to help you to enter the stream. People who have path and fruit, they understand the Dhamma with a lot of certainty. They have seen through, they have the Dhamma eye, as the Buddha would say. And when they conduct their retreats, then what happens is they can show you. If you are Suvacha, easy to instruct, as the Buddha says, so Anumana Sutta, and also understanding the defilements. If you are Suvacha, that you don't want to have these defilements, you want to bend, be flexible, follow the Buddha's instructions, then you are easier to instruct, it's easier to enter the stream. If you fight it, particularly on a meditation retreat, then it takes longer. It's harder for such a person to enter the stream. Too many strong views, not willing to budge, not willing to see where the Buddha is pointing to, not willing to see that there is the way out of suffering. And in a real sense, particularly if someone is helping you to cut off dependent origination. So meditation retreats, what you find is there are people who are high in mind energy. They can attain many of the highest states. They have seen past births. Some have the divine eye. Some also are able to, to actually see when the doorbar is lifted, the doorbar of ignorance. The intention behind meditation retreats in order to enter the stream is to lift the door bar. So on these meditation retreats, if you're fortunate to see the value of attending, then what happens is you are also cocooned within the safety with those kinds of people. People that lend metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. They have been cultivating compassion in order to serve, in order to be of benefit to others. And so when you attend a retreat and someone is helping you, the conditions for the meditation retreat are such that you bend. You allow yourself to have that time. You listen with eager ears. You write down the meditation steps. You make the most of that session. You maintain noble silence. What's really important is right view is there. It's been activated. The Noble Eightfold Path has been activated. So you do everything in your power not to break that. If one gossips and does all sorts of things during the meditation retreat, it's a loss for you because what the teacher or the person sharing Dhamma is doing is subduing the hindrances, helping you to do that and to remove the defilements. 
it's like we are performing surgery using the Buddha's instructions. And so collectively, everyone on the meditation retreat is doing that. And so there would be a lot of mind energy in that room, a lot of truth in that room, and a lot of renunciation. On a meditation retreat that goes one day, two days, three days, four days longer, what you're doing is giving up the discomfort of the body. What you're giving up is what you would have done with the time otherwise, whatever sensual indulgence you would have participated in. Instead, you are inclined towards Dhamma, inclined towards the Buddha's teaching, inclined towards Nibbana. And so that's very precious. If the meditation retreat runs over a number of days, it's very good to keep the mind quiet even when you go home. So when you come back, if it's a retreat where you're not staying over, it's very good to protect the mind. That's the fourth effort. Whatever you have cultivated that is kusala, you protect it, you guard it. And so when you complete the retreat, that's what you are doing. So the meditation retreat is very important because it takes you out of everyday life, the responsibilities for the most part. And you have this opportunity to dedicate yourself for however long the retreat goes for towards liberation, towards a good destination. And that is very rare. It is very, very rare. It is very rare for someone to incline to do it. It is very rare for someone to offer to do it. It is very rare for someone to host these retreats, particularly in lay people's homes. Because someone who is hosting takes on a lot as well. There's a tremendous giving for someone who hosts dummy events. And that person accrues a lot of merit. Also, when it comes to meditation retreats, it's a very meritorious thing for everyone involved. People don't realize if you help to move chairs, if you help to cook, if you help to, to do all these different things, even encourage, explain, if you help to print out things, if you help with the IT equipment, if you help to look after the teacher, whatever it is. And the other part of it is to also see the challenges that arise in meditation retreats. Sometimes, for example, we bring our parents with us or we bring our children with us. And what we find is we have too much care and concern about them. And usually it's the role that is challenging us, the parent role, the child role. What happens is out of goodness, we don't attend the retreat simply as a retreatant. We are still bearing the role. It's good to put that down. So there are certain things that come up and you do them. But for the most part, you need to put it down. Because if the role is the priority, then what happens is your meditation will not be as successful. There are many times where you see people come together and usually someone suffers because they're not able to dedicate to the meditation. They get troubled, challenged by the role, and they don't get the most out of the meditation retreat. And that's unfortunate. It, it takes a little longer in that case. So there are challenges that come even during the retreat, in the retreat. Also, the other thing to bear in mind is when you're on a meditation retreat, sometimes you need to be obedient to the teacher in the sense of if it's not time for questions and answers don't ask wait until the right time when there's a flow in the meditation retreat usually what's happening is the teacher or the person sharing dhamma is trying to protect everybody's mind for the meditation period when they are teaching a inside pathway they give a talk and then what happens is there's an explanation the reason why we don't go to coffee breaks and things before the meditation is because sensual desire blocks. It's a hindrance. Usually if there's a flow, it's up to the teacher to decide. And the teacher will normally decide, let's do the meditation and then we'll have the refreshments. Let's do the meditation and then we'll have lunch like that. And there's good reason for that, because when the Dhamma is active in the mind, the Buddha's words, the Buddha's instructions, it's all there. You've received a very heavy dose 
and you get an idea about the instructions or you're familiar with them and it's time to meditate together, then there's a reason for that. Now, if questions are asked at the wrong time, you break other people's concentration. You break your own concentration. Too much restlessness, too much doubt. Usually a good teacher will say, park that, put that to the side, just follow the instructions. Just be easy to instruct right now, questions later, particularly on a meditation retreat. And the reason for that is, if you ask it during the meditation retreat at the wrong time, what arises in other people's minds, which is not of benefit to them, is doubt, is restlessness and worry, things like that. So it's very important to not disrupt, to know that that's how the disruptions come. Because the meditation period is very important. When we meditate together, it feels safe. It feels possible. You feel encouraged. You feel inspired. Now, in terms of everyday life, where the start of this was about, there are many challenges. The advice is really to get on with everyday life and to set aside time as we've discussed. Time for daily practice, formal sits, walking meditation. What people misapprehend when they ask the question of how do I make this work in everyday life? One needs to have a healthy respect for Dhamma. You can't expect to practice Dhamma in a polluted, dirty place. It's not so easy because the mind gets defiled so easily. That, that's the short answer. The recommendation is to cultivate the daily practice, the daily sit, the daily walking meditation, and to undertake the inside pathway meditation. The reason for that is over time, you start to see the transformation. You start to become wiser. And with wisdom, when the faculties are sharper, you start to see in everyday life, it starts to transform. It happens naturally, gradually and naturally. Things start to fall away. So in defilements, you catch them earlier, you regret. So the daily practice is where you really need to practice, not at work where you're busy, where you're meant to be attending to certain things, not during family time, where you need to be present with what is happening with your children, with your partner, with your parents. And even when you're out in the community doing certain things, that's not necessarily the time to be thinking about the arising and passing away, about the complexities of defilements and things, or to point out other people's defilements. If you do such a thing, then in everyday life, you create more difficulties. You end up injuring yourself, like judging yourself too harshly in the wrong conditions. You end up hurting other people by coming across very judgmental. So for example, if you have been meditating on, on coupling karahara, physical nutriment, and you understand about not indulging and delighting too much in food, and you go out with your friends and you start to point out the Dhamma, that is not the appropriate time to be doing that not when you meet up for a meal. That's not the appropriate time. If you bring it up at that time, it's the wrong conditions and your friends will not be happy with you and you will end up feeling hurt by their judgment and by their response. It's good to understand the appropriate time and place. And when you're practicing, it's very good to develop these practices. So daily practice, attending and participating in Dhamma sessions, attending meditation retreats. Everyday life must go on. But what you'll notice, if you keep up with your daily practice, if you develop the spiritual faculties, if you sharpen them, if you develop insight from your meditation, if you participate in the Dhamma discussions, if you meditate regularly, encourage others, be of benefit to others, if you go on meditation retreats, help on meditation retreats, all those things contribute to increasing what happens in everyday life. The experiences that most people have are that if your practice is solid, if your effort is solid, 
if you really develop the Noble Eightfold Path, then what happens is everyday life unfolds in a more easeful way. There are still difficulties, there are still challenges, there is no perfection while we are still in samsara, but it becomes more manageable. The roller coaster ride with its extreme highs and extreme lows becomes a little smoother. It's still a roller coaster because we are the owners of our karma, heirs of our karma. But what people notice is when you really start to become Dhamma Vihari, which is all of our aspiration to live by the Dhamma, then things become slightly more easeful. One becomes more protected by the Devas. One has the propensity to offer safety to others through keeping precepts and being a generous person then that safety comes back to you. So the encouragement is very much towards all these different component parts of how we develop path and practice, our spiritual practice, and to understand that it is not easy, that it takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes effort, and it takes a very strong determination. But over time, you see things start to unfold in a better way, in the way that the Buddha prescribed. You become a wise person with Sukha Viharana, a pleasant abiding for the rest of this life. So we can end our session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem, wishing you well. Deruan Saranai.